I was just getting warmed up on that song there, kind of getting my throat ready, and <laughs> it's over. Sure good to be with all of you today, happy for the presence of each one. Uh, in this morning's uh, lessons, I'd like to uh, talk about some things for Christians to remember. It's one of the most important uh, things about our gathering together on the Lord's Day is to put ourselves in, uh, in mind of what the Lord has taught and many of the basic truths that we've taught that we can easily uh, forget about. I think about a lot of things in my own life, different events that have happened in the past that you know, you just completely forget happened. Talk, people talk about repressed memories that happen to us from time to time. I can remember I was telling Tabitha the other day about a time in high school I came out of, uh, of, of my friend's house with some other friends, and we were getting ready to get in the car, and a drunk driver came down the road and just destroyed the car we were about to get in. And like 20 years later, somebody brought up something, and it triggered that that happened. I'd totally forgotten. And that's the way our memory works. Even though we know something, we're grounded in it, it's easy for us to uh, have that written over by other things, and it kind of gets buried. And if we're not careful, we forget about the basic things that we ought to know and remember. That's why uh, the apostles emphasize so much the need that we have to be reminded of the things that we've been taught. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 12 through 15, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is, pre is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. So Peter uh, spent his time as an apostle trying to remind people of the things that had already been revealed, that they'd already been taught. It says they'd already been established in those things. So it's not, they'd been grounded in that teaching. And so you think, uh, oh, I've heard, I've heard these principles before. Well, the apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, knew it was important for us to hear the basic principles of the gospel repeated time and time again because we all have really good forgetters. <laughs> We're all very easy to get caught up in whatever's going on today and forget about the things we were grounded in yesterday. So constantly we have to bring these things to mind. Even things we've been established in, uh, we need to be reminded of and be able to call them to mind. He thought so much of it, he even wrote them these letters so that they'd have the letters after he died. They could go back and read about the basic truths that they need to follow being Christians. Paul didn't find it to be an irksome thing to preach about the fundamental principles of God's Word to people because he knew it was the safeguard for people's faith. Uh, Philippians 3, 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. So he says it's not a trouble, it's not irksome, it's not uh, something that he uh, found uh, tiresome to be able to repeat the same lessons to people because he knew the nature of men and how easy it is for us to be distracted from the truths that we know and uh, get caught up in the cares of this world and to forget about those basic principles that we need. He says it's a safeguard. It's going to guard you. It's going to keep you safe to continue to hear the truth. So always be ready to hear the old, old story and to hear the basic principles of God's Word uh, repeated. In uh, looking at these, I have seven different things that we could remember, things that we need to be reminded of. I know uh, something I didn't remember was Mother's Day uh, for the first part of the week, so I was kind of committed on my lesson here. But, you know, one of the things that mothers do, don't they, is they uh, remind you all the time about how to behave yourself and what you should be doing. And so 
uh, think of it that way. They try to pass on to you, especially our godly mothers, that uh, you need to follow and remember the things that God teaches you to do and keep them always before your mind and realize that you can be your own worst enemy. That's true of each one of us. Uh, we might be paranoid or be worried about what other people might do to us, but we need to look in the mirror and realize it's the person in the mirror that we look at, this person that can be our biggest problem. And the Bible warns us of that time and time again. We are not only made in the image of God, but we're fleshly people, and we have to fight against that flesh every day in all of the selfish desires that it stirs up. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So we have selfishness and emotions, each one of us, that we have to fight and crucify and keep under control. Uh, anger is uh, something that uh, you know some of us have as a besetting sin more than others, and all of us have to deal with it from time to time. And we have to be able to put a control on it, not let it control us. The tongue, James says, we all stumble in many ways in the things that we speak. So we constantly realize that we can be our own worst enemy if we let our tongue loose. Being spiteful or malicious uh, towards other people, wanting to repay others uh, with evil. Un being unforgiving is certainly a temptation to withhold that uh, forgiveness that God so freely gives to us. Over and over again, we need to have that forgiving spirit towards others. Being stubborn, being filled with sensuality, just wanting to do what makes me feel good. That's sensuality. I heard it described one time as a bear rubbing his back up against a tree, a sensuality. <laughs> he does doing whatever makes him feel good, right? And that's the way some people fall into with their lives. Instead of thinking about their duties and responsibilities that God has given us, we just think about, well, what's going to make me feel good? And we can be drifting away. We need to be able to change our minds when we're wrong. It's something that we try to uh, teach uh, children and grandchildren that, you know, go admit that you did wrong, that, you, you, uh, that you, you're in the wrong and apologize and so on. That's, and it's, it's like pulling teeth sometimes, isn't it, to try to get people to say, I was wrong. And sometimes that goes right into adulthood that a person has trouble being able to admit to their mate or people they work with or people in the church or with God that I was wrong and be able to confess that. If you're going to grow and improve, you've got to be able to repent. You've got to be able to admit when you're wrong. We're told in Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him turn, return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. God is ready to pardon, but the problem lies with us being able to admit when we do wrong. And we need to train ourselves and be reminded of that necessity. Yeah, we did it when we were baptized, but it needs to happen time and time again throughout our life because we're working on being what God wants us to be. In the book of Matthew in 21 verse 29, it talks about the two sons in a parable. One of them said to his father when he said to go and work in the field, he said, I'll go. But he didn't go. He just said he would go. The other son said, I will not. But then he said afterward he regretted it and he went. So he had some godly sorrow. He had some sorrow towards what he was doing toward his father. And he went ahead and went. So he could admit that he was wrong. And... Again, when you admit that you're wrong and that you need to change your thoughts, you're showing that you're wiser than you were yesterday, right? That's something that's happening there. You're showing some improvement in that now that you see the errors of your way. Uh, you admit you're in humanity. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we're admitting that about ourselves. We're human beings. We're not God. We're not perfect. We're not infinite like He is. He never has to change his mind, right? But we do. And constantly we need to remind ourselves of that necessity 
and not think it any strange thing. We're told that we are to be transformed in our thinking and not conform to the way of those around about us in this sinful world. In Romans 12 and verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So constantly we're trying to feed in our minds the thoughts of God and let those replace the thoughts that we have that are wrong about living life, about doctrine, about worship, about the work of the church, about the way that we behave in all our different relationships of life. We're renewing our mind with God's Word. It's a constant need to admit wrong and to change. In Ephesians 4 and verses 22 through 24, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So the truth is what allows us to be renewed. We have a perfect standard that's set for us in God's Word and in the example of Christ. And we're constantly measuring ourselves by that perfect standard. And it's necessary that we let those thoughts and those examples replace the bad patterns, the bad thinking that we have in our own life so that we can change and be what God wants us to be. So remember, you should change your mind when you're wrong. And we're often wrong. We need to continue to look at that perfect standard that is found in God's Word. Another requirement that is found in the Word of God is that we return good for evil. And this is a simple truth maybe you were taught many years ago when you read the New Testament for the first time and you came to the book of Romans and you read in 1 Peter and you found out you're not to take your own revenge but you're always to do good. You're not to curse, but you're to bless. When people curse you, you return a blessing instead. Huh? The Bible teaches we are always to do good. That's our duty. In Matthew 5 and verses 43 and 44, when Jesus was laying down the basic principles of His kingdom, He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So we have a standard to live by that's not the standard of the world. We have a standard to always do good. We always seek that which is in the best interest of whoever we come in contact with and we're seeking their salvation no matter what their uh, actions might be toward us or what their uh, will may be toward us. We are in harmony with what God wants for people. God sends the rain on the evil and the good. Through His goodness and patience, He tries to bring people to repentance. And we're to live that kind of life, reflect that kind of love in the way that we treat our fellow man and pray for our uh, fellow man and those that are lost in sin. We're praying that they might come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. So we pray for the salvation of all. We don't just pray for our family and our friends, but we pray for all people that they might be saved. In the Romans chapter 12 and verses 17 through 19, Paul there is laying down basic principles that Christians are to live by in Romans chapter 12. He's talked about what a great scheme of redemption we have to be saved by faith through grace. And then since we've received all these great mercies, how ought we to behave ourselves? And he begins to describe what this new life is where you've renewed your mind. And part of it is your attitude towards your fellow man all the time. That your obligation is to do good and never evil to other people. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So the obligation on us is to always do good. Never take personal revenge and do evil to anyone. Once you pay somebody back evil, then you've become evil yourself. So we have to remember 
we're here to do good. There are those that will take vengeance for God. God is going to take care of that job. He's got the government to punish evildoers and lawbreakers. There are those that are in authority. Don't we start, I hope, teaching little children even in school. You don't go out and punch Johnny out because he did something. You go talk to the teacher and the principal and you let those in authority take care of that. You don't do evil, right? You don't uh, return evil for evil. And the same way ought to be in all our life. Matter of fact, we should be doing good, even for enemies. In Romans 12, verse 20 and 21, Paul continues, But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, you conquer by doing good. Not by being conquered by doing evil yourself, but you overcome the evil by good. You try to win that person to repentance by doing good. Uh, I heard an old uh, preacher tell a story about a man. He lived next to a neighbor and his horse got out and the neighbor saw him and he said, I put your horse in the pound because it got out uh, of your pasture and if he gets out again, I'll do it again. And the man said, well, last week your cows got out and they were eating in my field and I put all your cows back and if they get out, I'll do it again. And the man felt bad and went and got his horse out and brought it back to him. He overcame evil with good and that's what all of us should do. We're going to do the good thing and the right thing uh, towards those that live around us and try to lead them to the light of what is right. We have to reinforce these things, the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even at the time that He was being thrown down on the cross and nailed to it, He showed us this attitude in praying for those that crucified Him. Yeah, I say, well, that's too much to ask. Well, the Lord did it. He's not do, asked us to do anything He didn't do Himself. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots and divided up his garments among themselves. So Jesus was praying that these men might come to repentance, that they might see the truth and be saved. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, many of them were, weren't they? And the days to follow. Many of them came to see the truth and were saved. The Lord's prayer was answered in regard to many of them, and that's what we're hoping for as we do good, even to people that do us wrong. Stephen showed that it wasn't just the Lord that could do that in the moment of his death, but also Stephen, the Lord's disciple, that great evangelist that was trying to uh, save the council there, even when they were stoning him to death, he was looking out for their best interest. He was not seeking revenge against them. They went on stoning Stephen, and he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. So that forgiving attitude, that desire for others to be saved, you can see clearly in the life of Stephen. Paul had good will towards the Jews. You think about all of the beatings that he received in the synagogues as he went from place to place. One time he was even stoned and left for dead and got up and went back into town and then went on to the next city and went on to the next synagogue and tried to preach to his fellow countrymen that they might be saved. It was his prayer in his heart that he could bring salvation to those that were persecuting him and causing him so much trouble. And it showed the desire in his heart that was in harmony with what the Lord teaches us. Don't return evil for evil, but do good instead. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, Paul said. How deeply did he desire the salvation of his fellow countrymen, even though they persecuted him and drove him out of town after town? He says in Romans 9, 1 through 3, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So that's that I know what I, 
my, my conscience is approving of what I'm telling you, that I'm telling you what I believe. And the Holy Spirit is a witness. He knows I'm telling you the truth. That I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. That's how strongly I wish I could save them. I wish they'd come to the truth. And that shows the loving kind of attitude that we need to be reminded of. And don't let that slip out of your mind. We live in a wicked world that's full of revenge. But that's not the way of the Christian. That's not what we've been taught. Don't blindly follow another. We're talking about following uninspired people, human beings, when it comes to what the true standard is. It's not our fellow man that has the message of salvation. It's God that has that message through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, the words of the New Testament. And only so far as somebody is following that, are we to follow anybody. We have to follow the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that we follow. We have to recognize the danger there is in following men. It doesn't matter who they are, they're fallible. And they are subject to uh, all of the temptations of the flesh just like you are. And they don't have the power to save you. Only Christ has that power. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Who was Jesus talking about when he delivered that statement? He was talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. Those that everybody was looking up to as the source of uh, the correct teaching when it came to salvation. But they were exalting their own ideas and their human traditions and exalting those traditions even above the Word of God and had become blind guides. And that can happen to any of us. You have to be on guard that somebody is not following their own ideas and trying to lead you astray. Uh, people are fallible and we are all responsible to recognize that and to know we've got to always go back to the pure source of God's truth which is the words of Christ and the apostles. Go back. Only Jesus Christ is the true guide. So like those Bereans, uh, when Paul was preaching, they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul was saying was so. And that's what you need to do with every sermon, every Bible class. Anytime somebody's talking about religious matters, make sure you check it out with the pure source of God's Word. Study and use your reason that God gave you and make proper application of God's Word. Don't let men without spiritual vision guide you into a ditch is what the Lord tells us. Don't trust in men is repeated again and again by way of reminder for us. In Psalms 146 and verse 3, Do not trust in princes, in mortal men or mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. Psalm 62, 9, men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balance they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Psalms 118, verses 8 and 9, men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. Uh, I think I just read that, didn't I? In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. So how was it we were saved? How is it that the gospel came into the world? Was it all the great philosophies of men that saved, that reached God? No, all of those great philosophers of the Greeks and other nations among the pagans, they never were able to lead people to the truth about God. No, that was not the way that salvation came. God, in His grace, sent the message down by His Son and through His apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, the truth came to this world. A truth that a lot of the wise people of the world that people put their trust in thought was foolishness that we should trust in one who died on a cross to pay for our sins and was raised again. Yeah, through a criminal, one treated as a criminal, we've been saved. 
That's God's message. But it's one we need to put our confidence in. Don't trust and lean upon the weak staff of men. It'll let you down. But go back to Jesus Christ and stay in Him. Here's what Jesus said about the path that we should trod, not the path that men as the majority take, but the path that Jesus has laid out for us, that God has provided. In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. <coughs> And there are few who find it. So most go the easy way. Just go the way of men. Go the way of the majority. Go the way that's popular. And don't have to put too much effort into study or researching for yourself. Just rely on some other person to guide you. But that's not the safe way to go. We need to seek personally that we find that narrow way. That narrow way is the way of Jesus Christ. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of the New Testament. And we're told it's never going to be the way of the majority of people. No, it's going to be the narrow way that you have to put forth effort to find. It's one where you lay down um, trust in yourself and mankind and you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And you walk in the way of that blood. You follow Him. And you can get through that gate and stay on that path that leads to eternal life in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul said, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now we can look to the apostles. They're good examples for us because they're following Christ. They're guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have seen in us. So Paul and the apostles and many of those early elders that they had in the church and evangelists, they were examples because they followed Christ. But we only follow people as they follow Christ. And we keep making sure that we look at the original uh, and not just the copy. Yes, we have approved examples to follow. And that's one way that God teaches us. But we want to always remember that their purpose is to follow Christ and to follow the gospel and imitate Him. There's a story about an epithet uh, that was uh, found on a, a tombstone. It said, Stranger, stop as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon will be. So prepare to follow me. Well, I guess physically speaking, maybe that's so, but someone else wrote under it, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> that's what we want to make sure. We want to make sure we know where we're going. And Jesus Christ is the one that can show us. So I remind you, <laughs> remember the original doctrine. Remember the original teacher that God has given us. And always go back to the original source to check everything out that we do. Well, there are a number of other principles to be reminded of, but we'll save those for the lesson to follow. This time we want to be dismissed to our classes, so if you'll bow with me for a word of prayer.